Hey, all you cool cats and kittens, it's your favorite history teacher back at you again with another historical video. And today we're going to be talking more about the Industrial Revolution and its beginnings from where it started. So uh, buckle up your seat belts and uh, let's get ready for the ride. Um, let's let's get into it, people. Hope you guys are excited. Um, Industrial Revolution. We're already halfway through the chapter, halfway through the unit. All right, Britain leads the way. Yes, Britain leads the way. Chapter five, section two. Hold on, let me move my, let me move my toolbar. Get out of here. All right, that's your warm up. See how I didn't put the objectives first? I don't know why I did that for yesterday. Anyways, objectives. Uh, you'll be able to analyze why Britain was the center point for the Industrial Revolution and explain the advances made in textile production and transportation. Oh. Uh, remember, like, like I said yesterday, uh, when I brought out the underlying uh, items, anything that is underlined is definitely going to be on your test and your final. Um, again, still debating on whether or not to have a multiple choice uh, final exam for y'all. We'll see. We'll see how, how the year plays itself out. Anyways, why Britain? Why Britain? Okay. Um, Britain had the, uh, you can bet your bottom dollar uh, on your test. You're going to be asked, why did the Industrial Revolution start in Britain? So, I'm just I'm just spoon feeding you the answers. Anyways, Britain had the advantage of plentiful natural resources such as natural ports and navigable rivers, uh, Liverpool, um, London. Although I don't think <laughs> London is not a port city. What am I thinking? Uh, it's a trading town, trading center. Um, rivers supplied water power and allowed for the construction of canals. And these canals are going to increase accessibility for trade and we're instrumental in bringing goods to the market. Because remember, before boats could go down these uh, canals and rivers, uh, people just walked. Or if you, if you had enough money uh, to buy a carriage and enough money to uh, buy mules or horses, you, you walked. Uh, anyways, Britain was also able to establish communications and transport cheaply due to its easy accessibility from the sea to, uh, to the sea from all points. If you didn't know, Britain, the island of Britain, including Scotland and Wales and England, that is a island nation, so it's surrounded by water. Britain was plentiful in coal supply, which was fundamental to industrialization. As we learned yesterday, coal powered the steam engine which the steam engine drove the industrial revolution forward so coal is needed and the vast supplies of iron available to build new machines also uh, was able to progress britain in, in britain and not anywhere else okay cool all right so uh here's a map of Great Britain during the Industrial Revolution, 1851. So these blue triangles are coal resources. These, uh, what was that, orange? Orange uh, triangles are iron ore um, resources. And then you have products like the blue circle of cotton. Cotton's everywhere. Um, woolens, okay and machinery this is 1851 all right so start from the bottom now we hear uh in the 1700s britain had a lot of skilled mechanics who were eager to meet the growing demand of these new practical inventions and this ready workforce along with the population boom increased the demand for goods you know 
kind of kind of like yesterday with the agricultural revolution, you know, leading to a boom in population growth. Um, well, now that people can live longer, uh, they can buy more things, and this it's this consumer uh, con- consumer consumption uh, that is going to drive businesses to make more goods. So in order to increase the production of goods to meet demand, money would be necessary to start businesses, capital, investments. And from the mid 1600s, 1700s, trade from a growing seas empire had helped the British economy prosper, i.e. colonies. Colonies. All right, British growth. So beginning with the slave trade, the business class accumulated capital. What is capital? Capital is money to invest in enterprises. What are enterprises? Enterprises are business organizations in such an area, such as shipping, mining, railroads, or factories. And many businesses are willing to risk their capital in new ventures due to this healthy 18th century economy. Remember the 18th century is 1700s. Uh, Britain also had a stable government that supported economic growth. While other European countries faced river tolls, Britain did not. The government also, as we know from the American Revolution, they had a strong navy because, hey, if you're if you're an island nation, you got to be good at ships um, that protected their empire because, you know, England what had their hands everywhere. Uh, you could say North America, you could say South Africa, maybe some parts of East Africa, no, West Africa, okay, Egypt, India, some ports in China, and of course, Australia. And then um, remember, entrepreneurs are people who assumed these financial risks of starting new businesses. The risk is it could either succeed or it could fail. Entrepreneurs, entrepreneurship, okay? Risking their money. All right, so the British putting out system. So the Industrial Revolution first took place in Britain's largest industry, the textile industry. What are textiles? Clothes, all right? So in the 1600s, cotton cloth was being imported from India and had become very popular. Uh, British merchants tried to organize a cotton cloth industry at home. It's called the POS, not not what you think it means. It's called the P, the P, the putting out system or other other books, other textbooks call it the, the cottage industry where raw cotton that was brought over from India, that was brought over from Egypt, that was brought over from the American South uh, would be distributed to these peasant families in these cottages in these small small little villages who would have these devices um, in their homes and they would spin their cotton into thread or weave the thread into cloth to uh, you know produce it in their in their own homes okay they're putting out a product and then these skilled artisans in the towns, uh, would come and pick them up and finish finish the final product of the cloth and dye the cloth that would be ready for purchase. You know, if you wanted a red shirt, you wanted a blue shirt, you wanted a green shirt, green underwear, red underwear. You get my drift. So here's a here's like a picture. Okay, largely, largely, mostly women, bigly. All right, so new events to the textile industry. So the putting out system, you can imagine, was slow, especially if there's only one woman in the household, which is why women had kids, so they can work. So uh, as demand for cloth grew, because they wanted to be clothed, uh, inventors are going to come up with a string of remarkable devices that revolutionize the British textile industry. This whole slide, test question. So John Kay, he invented the flying shuttle, which would enable weavers uh, to work fast, to work so fast that they could soon outpace the spinners. 
uh, James Hargreaves, he, inc- he invented the spinning Jenny in 1764, where they would spin multiple threads at the same time. You lose just one, now you got multiple. And then Richard Arkwright created the water frame in 1769, and he improved the spinning machine so that it could be powered by water and not by hand. So, uh, yeah. Thank you, Richard Arkwright. You saved the shoulders of many. So here's a picture of the flying shuttle. Here's James Hargreaves and his spinning Jenny. He named the spinning Jenny after his daughter, Jenny. Uh, This is Richard Arkwright's uh, water frame. Okay, gin that cotton. Uh, In America, these faster spinning and weaving machines would produce a problem. How to produce enough raw cotton to keep up with the demands of England. Okay, this is this is uh, a little bit before the um, American Revolution, kind of after the American Revolution. Okay, and so raw cotton grown in the South had to be cleaned of dirt and seeds by hands of slaves, which was a time-consuming task. Uh, if you've ever seen Cotton, if you've ever seen oh, uh, the movie uh, 12 Years a Slave, um, and it shows them picking cotton in the fields, okay? Cotton isn't just like what you think like cotton balls look like, you know, those little fluffy fluffy cotton balls that you, you, you know, you dab some alcohol on a cut or a wound, right? Okay, it's not that fluffy. It's not, doesn't look like cotton candy, okay? It's uh, grown and it has like thorns and pokey things and, and it sticks to the, to the flower. So you gotta, you gotta pull that cotton, okay? And doing it by hand, making sure you get all the cotton grown, picked, um, well, it's, it's time consuming and it hurts. Uh, sometimes, you know, when I've been golfing, I've had to find lost balls and there are like thorns, rose bushes everywhere. Uh, and you know, getting poked by a thorn ain't fun. Well, if you had to do this for a living, woo we, um, so Eli Whitney invented something called the cotton gin. Or oh, gin is short for cot. Uh, gin is short for cotton. Oh, gin. Gin is short for engine. And so to solve this, the cotton gin separated seeds from the raw cotton at a fast rate. Uh, and he finished the cotton gin in 1793. And cotton production is going to increase exponentially. And it is because of Eli Whitney's. Um, invention that slavery in the American South skyrockets because in order to, you know, make the most money, you got to grow the most cotton so you can sell it to consumers who need that cotton, who are going to spin it, right? So the faster I can get cotton grown and cotton picked, the faster I can make more money. So I need more slaves. Thank you, Eli Whitney. So this is, uh, it kind of looks like James Watt from yesterday. (laughs) Uh, Eli Whitney's cotton gin. So here you would turn it. Again, I'm pointing at my my screen. Uh, Again, you would turn it and these combs thread through the cotton and the seeds I believe are deposited right here. And uh, the clean cotton is right here. Again, from hand, okay, doesn't look fun, okay, to machine. And they're just bags of cotton, and they're they're just, they're just cleaning it, cleaning the cotton, cleaning the cotton, okay. All right, factories. So new machines doomed the putting out system as they were too big and too expensive for homes. So instead, manufacturers began to build sheds to house these machines near rapidly moving streams. Thank you, Richard Arkwright, for your water-powered water frame spinning machines, uh, which could harness the water power to run these machines. 
Soon, the steam engine would power the, the rest of these machines, but spinners and weavers now came to work each day in these factories, and factories brought together workers and machines to produce large quantities of goods. So, you know, working in the uh, environment of your own home uh, couldn't, be, couldn't be done anymore. You couldn't work at your own pace. Now you were paid to work and get this done. So uh, later on, thanks for the pollution. So transportation revolution. As production increased, entrepreneurs need faster and cheaper methods of moving goods from place to place. Some capitalists invested in turnpikes, which are private roads that charge travelers a toll to use them, kind of like, you know, if you want to use the express lane on 880 or 680, or 580, you or whatever, whatever road you see in the Bay Area and you see there's a fast track lane, that's like a toll or like toll bridges um, when you're coming in, no, when you're leaving the Bay Area or coming into the Bay Area, you know, you gotta cross the San Mateo Bridge, uh, the Golden Gate Bridge, you gotta pay a toll. So goods traveled faster as a result and turnpikes soon linked every part of Britain together. Uh, other entrepreneurs had uh, canals dug out to connect rivers together or to connect inland towns with coastal ports. Uh, engineers are gonna build stronger bridges and upgraded harbors to help the expanding overseas trade. It's jobs created everywhere, all right? And these people that soon got pushed out from the countryside by incl the enclosure movement during the uh, agricultural revolution Here's where your jobs would become found. So here's a map of turnpikes, canals to bridges. Again, <laughs> I always like looking at this picture because like, how you got a boat up there? And then you see this, uh, these two horses are pulling the boat across because I believe there's a docking area uh, somewhere in this picture. All right, frugal. So, um, during the late 1700s and early 1800s, factories needed an efficient, there's that word again, efficient and inexpensive, they're cheap, way to receive coal and raw goods and then ship them final goods off to the market. In 1763, the Bridgewater Canal opened and not only made a profit from tolls, but cut the price in half of coal in Manchester. And the success of this set off a canal building frenzy. And companies were soon formed to construct canals for profit uh, because, you know, money, money, money. However, not all the canals built had enough traffic to make the profit. And soon those companies are going to go bankrupt. Uh, canals are going to lose their importance when steam locomotives made railroads the preference of travel. Hey, railroads, more. Uh, so the invention of the steam locomotive engine uh, made the growth of railroads possible in the early 1800s. A man named George Stevenson developed the steam-powered locomotive to pull carriages along iron rails. These are like the beginning of railroad rail trains. These railroads did not have to follow the course of a river. That is key, all right? No longer did you have to follow the course of a river to get your goods to market. If you needed to get it from Liverpool to Manchester, um, you did it through railroads. If you needed to go from London to, I, I don't know, um, I'm gonna say Manchester again. Uh, can, do I have a map on here? If you wanted to go from London to say Cambridge, okay, you're gonna you're gonna go boop, okay, because these are turnpikes, and so you're just you're, the straightest way. Uh, you know the what is it the the shortest distance between two points is a, is a straight line. Hey, teaching us some math. Uh, so there you go, uh, a straight line. This also meant tracks could go places where rivers did not, which allowed factory owners and merchants to ship goods swiftly and cheaply over land. And the world's first rail, rail line was from, hey, Liverpool to Manchester. And that opened up in 1830. In the following decades, RR railroads 
uh, travel became faster and RR railroad building boomed across the world. So here you have a little map of Manchester to Liverpool. Liverpool. And if you're a soccer fan, um, they consider Liverpool, Manchester United, one of the country's greatest rivalry. And then you wonder why. They have a long standing tradition. And if you're a soccer fan, uh, you know who these people be. Uh, anyways, the wave. Okay, as the Industrial Revolution got underway, it triggered a chain reaction. Uh, I believe this is a test question. So once investors developed machines that could produce large quantities of goods more efficiently, prices fell. Prices are cheaper. Lower prices made goods more affordable and thus created more consumers who could feed the demand for the goods. So now that I got cheap goods at cheap prices and it's super cheap that even any regu regular commoner could buy these cheap new goods that's going to demand, demand, demand more from these companies to keep producing these goods. And it's going to just create a cycle of economic and social changes. And it's going to dramatically affect the way people live. Uh, capitalism. Capitalism. And there we go. Um, Oh, I don't have your homework. Jeez. Uh, your homework is, hold up, wait a minute. Uh, well, that, that concludes this, this, before I get ahead of myself, that concludes this um, lecture. Uh, hopefully you did enjoy that. You know, I kind of cut it off a little bit short, but you know, that, that wave, that cycle of consumption, you know, it really affects everything that these businesses that, that, that are beginning to come about during the Industrial Revolution, it's going to cause them to grow dramatically, okay? So hopefully you remember that. I believe that is on your, on your test. Um, I think your test, test can also be next week. It's a short unit, people. It's a short unit. It's only a chapter. All right, so uh, you'll see a lot. Some of my units become chapters later on. So it is what it is. Anywho, uh, hopefully you did enjoy. If you did, make sure you hit that like button. Uh, your homework is to complete page 177, three through five. And as always, stay safe, wash your hands. Peace.